Okay, welcome and hello to today. Just a couple quick messages from the rest of us here at City of Sanctuary UK. Um, as we get close to the holiday season, we are running a big fundraiser right now where all of our funding will be doubled. So uh, I'm gonna ask my colleagues to drop into the chat the link to that fundraiser. We are a very small shoestring charity um, that's been doing a lot of growing over the last two years. So any, any donations or any networks that you could share that fundraiser with would be really warmly welcomed. Um, as I said earlier, we're here today to talk about uh, some fantastic examples of supporting student welfare and well-being at two of our Colleges of Sanctuary, and so I'm really delighted that we're going to be able to talk about all this today. Um, I just also wanted to share some really positive, lovely news, and that is to congratulate our colleagues at Preston College, some of whom are on the call today. Uh, they just had their reaccreditation process completed yesterday and um, have been recognized as a College of Sanctuary. For those of you who aren't kind of new to the network, there's about 19 colleges across the UK that have gone through this process. And so we're regrowing quite quickly over the last couple of years. And it's been a really uh, in, uh, invigorating time for those of us on, this, on the team. It has also meant that we've grown probably faster than we anticipated uh, over the last couple of years, uh, which means that in order to help us kind of manage the process and engage with as many colleges as we can, we have set up a process of planning and a set of deadlines for this coming academic year. I think most colleges that are on the call have either been in touch or know about this, but just to uh, let people know that tomorrow, December 1st, is actually our kind of deadline to be notified if you are planning to submit an application in, the, in 2024. If you have any questions about that, please do feel free to reach out to us after this um, session today and we can talk more about it. But without further ado, I want to turn over to our colleges today who are going to be speaking about their work. Uh, we're first going to hear from the team from Leeds City College. So I'm going to hand over to Rob and Catherine uh, to share from their work. So over to you guys. Thank you, Sarah. Hi. Um, can you all hear me? I've unmuted the mic. That's the main thing. I went for. Thanks. OK, so I'm Catherine Mitten. I'm Student Funds Finance Manager um, at Leeds City College. And I've got as well with me today Rob Patterson, who's our uh, Student Funds Coordinator in Leeds. So I'm just going to take you through some of the support that we give um, sort of the refugees and asylum seeker learners within Leeds City College. We need to make sure that when we are giving any support to them, that we do remain audit compliant at all times. And this means that we do still need these students to apply for learner support funds with us. They still need to fill in the correct application form and they still need to produce um, some sort of evidence that we can use um, for audit purposes. So to apply for our funding, we have an electronic application form that gets sent out to all learners, um, regardless of status, once they're enrolled at the college. Now, we know the electronic sort of email Emails might be a bit of a barrier to sort of some of these learners. So we also have a paper application form available, which we do allow these learners to take home, fill them in with sort of friends and family at home. They can help have staff in college as well who can also assist with these form filling in. We then ask them to bring them into college and to be assessed for support. So to be assessed, we do ask for them to follow our criteria. So that's our household income of £30,000 and below. Now, we know asylum seekers and refugees will be below that. So what we do ask is that they show us some sort of eligibility. So it might be their ASPIN cards, art cards. Um, it could be a home office letter as well, we accept. Or it might be a universal credit statement that we've got. Um, we do work with them as well. So if they haven't got um, sort of those documentations, we'll work with them see what evidence they've got what documentations we've got as well to make sure we can get that support in place once we've had that application form assessed then we can get the support set up so a lot of the key areas of support we give might be travel support we help with and um, help with childcare while they're in college and help with meals as well so they're kind of the main areas that we're just going to touch upon um this morning briefly this afternoon so so meal support, we do ask that learners are in college for five hours um, or more a day to receive that meal support. So for adults, we do provide them with money on their st uh, student cards to go and spend in the canteens. And for adults, it's £3.60 a day. For the younger learners, 16 to 18, we've been able to increase that amount this year to £6.50 per day. And that also means they can get some breakfast as well while they're in college with us, as well as some lunch as well. Um, so we've been really pleased that we've been able to increase that support for meals um, this year. Um, I'm just going to pass you over to Rob now, who will sort of briefly tell you about the travel support we give. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Rob Patterson, Student Funds Coordinator at Leeds City College. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the travel aspects of the funds today. So uh, as I'm sure many, if not all of you are aware, a vast proportion of asylum seeker learners are situated in hotels, often in locations that are quite a distance from campus to study or just generally awkward to get to and from. This often means that they'll be required to take a combination of different bus services or sometimes train and bus. Uh, due to the number of services that operate uh, within West Yorkshire, this can be rather confusing. So to bridge this gap and remove uh, what is quite a significant barrier to learning, uh, over the last couple of years, we've adopted the usage of a smartphone app and it covers all of these things. Uh, the app in question can be on all bus services that run within West Yorkshire, but also um, you can use uh, train passes on that, the same app as well. Uh, this level of flexibility is proven uh, invaluable, uh, particularly when learners are moved from one location to another at very short notice, which, as I'm sure you're aware, does happen all too often. Uh, it means that we don't have to cancel passes and reissue a different one, which can cause a delay. But more importantly, the consistency removes any undue stress to the learner or any complication. Uh, learner engagement, social uh, safety, social mobility and active citizenship is of paramount importance. So it's vital that the support we offer is consistent and goes unbroken. Now we appreciate that not all learners will have access to a smartphone. So we always have a uh, paper or card alternative for each of the major bus companies. And we can issue a combination of those depending on the, the learner's individual needs. Uh, if we have any learners who are traveling from further afield, um, maybe not covered by one of our passes, we can also offer travel payments directly into their bank accounts or to a trusted third party if they don't have access to their own. If one of the aforementioned options is still not viable, then we can ask departments to use their, um, their credit card to purchase travel for the learner. And then uh, Catherine uh, recharges the money directly to them. We tend to utilize these options when learners are moved suddenly or have had to flee from certain situations and we've had to react quickly to a safeguarding situation. Essentially, we have multiple options in place to cover uh, pretty much every problem. Uh, as Catherine's already mentioned, all learners are assessed for eligibility and for learners aged 19 plus, they must also live 1.5 miles from the campus of study to be eligible for travel. However, we are able to be flexible on this and make discretionary decisions as a lot of our learners have um, childcare needs or caring responsibilities, meaning that they would have to drop the children off at multiple locations. And uh, without the travel support, these learners will be late each day, unable to engage fully, and will be at risk of withdrawing from their studies. Uh, sadly, we also have a lot of learners who've had to flee their home countries, and many have um, ongoing or underlying health issues, which can and do hinder their ability to walk one and a half miles. However, we are able to uh, make discretion decisions based on medical evidence, and provide these learners with the travel support that they need. Um, a letter from a GP will suffice, but we did actually have one learner who brought in an X-ray which showed a bullet um, lodged in the hip. So it was suffice to say uh, we did issue travel, um, travel immediately, and delighted to say the learner was able to complete the complete their studies and he did go on to university as well. I mean, thankfully, this is an isolated case, but it brings home the importance of the work we do how fortunate we all are, and it shows the positive impact we can and do have on learners' journeys. It drives us to continually improve and expand on the work that we do. And I'll uh, pass you back to Catherine. Thanks, Rob. So I'm just going to briefly touch on the other big uh, support area that we give these learners, and that is childcare support. Um, so we will pay up to £55 for a full day childcare session or £30 for a half day childcare session. Um, we make sure that if a learner is in college for, say, half a day, but they need that travel time at either side to go and pick up the child from nursery, from childminder, that we do cover that tra uh, travel time as well, because we don't want them having to leave the lessons early um, and missing out on college time just because we're only paying for half a day. We do sort of cover the travel time as well. We're really fortunate at Leeds. We have a dedicated childcare advisor who works for us and she's really good at sort of supporting these learners through applying for childcare support, um, finding the providers, um, talking with these providers, arranging for these learners to go and visit them as well, making sure they're happy with them and the children get settled in as well. She's also really good at sort of supporting them and um, reapplying the following year as well. So we make sure that that childcare support is consistent as well and keeps going for more than one year. 
that we do have a separate application process though to apply for childcare um, compared to sort of meals and travel. So just because it's worth so much more money, um, we need to make sure that I sort of look at this um, separately and I individually assess every single childcare application. Um, we then also need to draw up contracts with the providers as well and just make sure that we're only paying for the days that the students are in um, college at their timetable to be in as well. If we do have learners who we find are withdrawn from college, um, then this is when we'll then contact childcare providers as well and just make sure that they're aware that the learners aren't attending college anymore. So we'll have to cease their childcare cover. But we wouldn't do that without checking with the departments, making sure that um, you know, they're aware we're going to cancel it because the last thing we want to do is cancel childcare cover and then we find out for a reason the students come back or they were missing college for a reason. So we always work with the departments when trying to give this support out. Um, we also so let sort of returning students apply early as well so in June July time so again we can get that support set up early so they can come back in September and it's all ready to go and they can sort of start back in college um, nice and fresh. The other area that I was just going to touch upon as well with sort of the support that we give is some of the posters that we've done for Learner Support Fund. So we have posters that we put up around college to um, advise learners about the support they can get and that they're eligible for. We've recently um, developed some for refugees where we've really, refugees and asylum seekers, where we've really sort of simplified these posters. We've put a lot more pictures on them, taken away a lot of wording as well, because we know a lot of the words, they don't mean a lot. We need the pictures there. This year as well, we've developed two posters and we've actually managed to translate these into Arabic and um, Tigrini, Tigrini, sorry if I've pronounced that wrong. Um, so we've done those two posters, which we know have been used um, in our ESOL classrooms. So I'm really hoping they've sort of helped as well, help some of these learners overcome these barriers. Um, and that's about everything we've got, sort of the high level sort of cover that we do at Leeds. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Fantastic to hear all that work. Um, I was just going to see, Leila, are you feeling prepared? We have a lovely video from Leeds City College, but I thought we would hear from all the speakers first before we show that video, just um, uh, because I want to make sure we have the most time. For Let's, You're ready? We're ready. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen then so I can share your slides and you can just tell me when. Um... Oh, I can share them now. Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay, you're good. Have you got them? I, I do have them, but I, I just in case of emergency to help no, you I out. Mean, but... Can you see my slides? Oh, yes, we can. Oh, good. Um, okay, we shall begin. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we're delighted to get College of Sanctuary, I think, last December. So we've almost got a year under our belt and building on the work that we did. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm responsible for student experience across um Peterborough College, um, but also have a um, strategic responsibility around safeguarding and prevent, um, and my colleague. So yeah, my name's Claire Wookie and I'm head of faculty for ESOL, which is where the majority of our um, asylum seekers, refugees, as well as children in care, care leavers sit. Um, and we have provision here at main site, which is full-time, part-time, and we also have another centre in the city centre that's easily accessible for adult provision as well. So we have quite a large um, ESOL uh, deliver, delivery. Um, and, you know, just really brief setting the scene, you know, it, we are quite a large establishment and we do go across. So Claire has outreach provision. Um, we do have two sites, Stanford and Peterborough site, but we also have some um, outreach subcontracted um community work such as our Gladka provision which really works in the heart of our city where we have a lot of adult um, asylum seekers and refugees and also going out into factories now as well where there's um, ESOL workers you know so we're, so we're, we're trying to well. really get out there as much as we can so just um, a little bit you know about which I think you all know, you know, our commitment really for us to be able to make sure that it happens on the ground for our young people and adults um, who are seeking sanctuary. Um, we've embedded it in all aspects around our, our strategy um, and we have got full commitment, you know, with our senior leadership team and it really does help make a difference with funding and making sure we're able to get that operational um, sort of stance and processes in place. I think one of the key differences as well was that in January 23, we actually had a mentor that worked specifically with our ESOL cohort 
um, around asylum seekers and refugees. And, and that's, you know, really been a key part of that provision where they're, you know, doing a lot of enrichment pastoral support actually on the ground rather than those learners having to visit another part of the college. So it's embedded within the delivery area. Um, I'm not going to read through the slides because I'm more than happy for them to be shared. Um, and again, I think we've talked about, you know, it's that journey inward, really. Um, and um, again, we're because we're very lucky of sort of the hands in pies we've got across our communities. Um, we obviously get to go and have those conversations um, in our, our sort of stakeholder community, but then also to support that onboarding. But also when um, our young people and adults are on board, um, then, you know, there's all types of support that starts really from that entry process. Um, and I think, as Claire said, the majority, uh, about 80% are on our ESOL programmes, but we do have students on our mainstream programmes and they also progress. Um, and the majority will go into construction, hairdressing, those types. So we've ongoing um, building of tasters and link programmes and um, opportunities for that peer teaching as well, because it really helps with the language barriers. Um, so college life as you know as part of that onboarding it's also the messages that we give to all of our other students because we want our college community to understand their peers um and also you know so those messages are there around safeguarding and welfare and our commitment to EGI um for our main student body but also those messages out there to our young people and adults who are asylum seekers and refugees so just really you know student hub, the student handbook. Um, we have a college life um, booklet that all students get. And, you know, really this is, it shows where that embedding is because, you know, it, it is about respecting the values. Um, and as much as we would love um, everybody to respect everybody's different protected characteristics, I'm not just talking about asylum seekers and refugees, you know, they do come in with their social norms and there are those expectations. So again, we've made sure that it's it's rippled throughout all of our processes and the services that our students can expect. And I think from an ESOL perspective, when they're brand new coming into college, we do an awful lot of work on this in the lower level courses to get them ready for college life and get them ready for living in the UK. So a lot of this stuff is embedded within their curriculum. Um, oh. Just the visuals, I know our Leeds colleagues talked about, um, you know, posters and things like that. You know, absolutely. We, again, um, and I know we've got some posters in class slides, and we do have the student conduct, code of conduct and handbook in different languages um, and those sorts of messages. But also we have um, forums and groups where we actually go in and work with the student to get their voice so that there can be some of that co-produced work. Um, but also... Our student engagement team, um, they're really key um, to that element and working with our student mentor in ESOL, our pastoral lead around those engagement opportunities, because we know from, you know, talking to the students um, and working with them that obviously and this is not new to um, any of my colleagues in around the meeting, but they have such little opportunities outside of when they're with us um you know we try to give them all those other things that will help with their physical and mental well-being um and that's where we put on you know dedicated clubs and activities uh i've mentioned about the student voice um i've meant we've mentioned about key roles because we also have a vulnerable learner lead you know and again this was a role that we developed from an existing role um so we've also got our care leaders in there because you know, those young people do, um, you know, go from being ch children in care or separated migrant children um, into being care leavers, but that's still an ongoing support that's needed, you know, as they transition. Um, but we also have um, a new EDI coordinator. We have within our student union identified roles that will also look to work with their peers, um, you know, and again, it's, it's embedding it in with our class reps, um, and our engagement calendar of events, you know, um, that we have throughout the year. It's not just about celebrating and recognising those opportunities when it's, I don't know, National Refugee Week, but it's embedding it with regards to all of the events that we celebrate. 
Um, and I think um, just some examples and, you know, if you're wondering how do we fund all of this, we've been um, working with our um, Cambridge and Peterborough local authorities for the last couple of years because of our numbers of children in care. And obviously then the majority of those are what were unaccompanied or separated migrant children now and care leavers. We've been able to secure um, funding from our virtual schools for enrichment and engagement opportunities that we can run um, that really enhance that curriculum offer, but also because they know, you know, they're happy to give us um, that funding to support those very things, you know, as long as we share the feedback and the positive impact that it has. And um, I've looked at the data for our college self-assessment and, uh, you know, that really has improved for our children in care, you know, that retention and that achievement has really made a big difference over this last year um, to have sort of that investment and the money that they contributed this year is an increase from last year. Um, and some of the things that we're looking at planning are things like a summer workshop um, for yes, English yes. and maths because yeah. we've recognised and, you know, colleagues will know T levels and things like that. It's just going to make that barrier even higher for, you know, those with language um, challenges to progress um, onto some of those or upwards in those mainstream programs. So again, we're looking at how we can upskill. Um, but it's really nice to also have um, the students' pictures because they're getting, you know, this. these were activities that they chose and wanted to do. Um, and again, you know, some of the work with manufacturers and warehouses and, you know, again, that helps them to get that feel about um, work experience, which they're desperate to do. Um, and I know we've got colleagues, Mo, who's actually looking at that, isn't he, is trying to get work experience with some of the employers that we use for our apprenticeships. I think some of the key things from this engagement and, and enrichment is ESOL is a really heavy going course. Sorry, if we can just go back to that one sec. It's a really heavy going course. And if they're sat in a classroom learning a language three days a week, full time, that is too much. So we do always make sure that there's an enrichment activity in there, be that sports. Now, for some, that may well be used as catch up if they've missed work. But, um, you know, they board games is amazing within the classroom because it gets that teamwork going. They talk to each other, but we also give them options where they can just sit and chat and talk to each other about their own experiences, get the staff involved in that. And whilst um, a lot of those learners don't have the right to work at the moment, they will have in the future. So, you know, giving them aspirations around, you know, we're, in Peterborough, we've got a massive Amazon warehouse that's, um, you know, it's, it's also linked in with the care covenant. So, you know, for children in care, there is always a guaranteed interview uh, at, at places like that. So it's thinking bigger picture with it, really, and just linking in. So, um, and as Claire mentioned about, you know, it's those community stakeholders that we can, um, you know, get involved um, and to help. And, and really that partnership is key. Um, but it has allowed us to do, you know, um, some such things, whether it's the Refugee Council and Drama Therapy, you know, fishing, um, Garden of Sanctuary Project. I just love that because, you know, they'll be getting involved in growing and we have patches of land that really need some TLC. Um, but also we have, you. most colleges have catering courses that their students do. So actually they're also providing, you know, the the some of the, the stuff for that. We did a really good uh, thing at the end of last year called the, in, in, it was an intergenerational cooking where we got um, adult learners from another provider that we um, that we use, Gladka, and we got our young 16 to 18 learners and they um, met each other and cooked a meal. And then, you know, we, we had some people from the community, the mayor and things were invited so that they could, you know, work together as a community and, those links between the young and the older ones that are in their communities, building those in a very different way um, has, has been really successful. And we're looking at taking that into the garden as well. So gardening through the generations, intergenerational gardening, intergenerational whatever we're going to try and embed. So, And I think just sort of like it's sort of hot off the press, but, you know, um, we are... Our college is right next to a clear hole build area, which is a home office initiative. Um, and the, the, the particular 
postcode that that is in a very small um, space um, has identified high amounts of um, criminality and um, exploitation. And we know that 50 percent, we've done some exercises with our data, 50 percent of our asylum seekers and refugees actually live um, in that hotspot. So, um, you know, I had a meeting with one of the chief inspectors um, this week, and that's about working with us and our community partner, Gladka, to, um, because the police have asked, they need to be able to support effectively people in the community, that language support. Um, again, so it sort of almost triangulates that community work. Um, again, I won't read out, but you've got this sorts of examples of the sorts of things that we've done. Um, Again, there's pictures with trips that we've done, I'm just mindful of time. Um, and I think the other thing is, is about, you know, we have our student awards every year and that's a really big event. We established the College of Sanctuary Student Award last year and um, Claire um, got had the privilege of presenting it and it was fantastic. And again, it, you know, it was the story of your ESOL student that actually um, he actually became our student recognised, not just College of Sanctuary student, but was got the Student of the Year Award. Um, so again, that's just really fantastic. Um, and again, a positive reflection. Um, and I think the other thing is, it's about looking at those opportunities. And again, where we can use that virtual schools funding. Um, so we have got a student, we sponsored, we used it, used it to sponsor because there was um, an existing um, student, E3 student, um, who wanted to run their own football. I was going to say group, but that is the wrong word. Club. Club. Um, and I've got it all um, registered with the FAA, local FA and stuff like that, because actually our new EDI coordinator, who's very involved with us, supporting us as well, um, has an FA background um, and so has been able to support that process because the majority of the young people that were in that football club were also our asylum seeking students. Um, and also we've been working with the um, FA um, on a Rising Leaders um, programme. And we were really delighted to be able to nominate, have three of our ESOL students nominated. And one of them has actually um, been selected and will be attending the training. Um, so now I'm just going to hand over to Claire, who's going to do a very swift walkthrough for our um, about our resale provision. Yeah, so that's just a little bit really about our numbers. So, you know, 200 full time um, learners, of which I would say 75, 80 percent of those are asylum seekers and refugees. We also do a lot of part time provision, um, both here and at JobSmart. And 102 of those are in care out of that 263 are care leavers. So. It's, it's a high, high proportion um, of, of the learners in my area. So we, we do um, qualifications from um, entry one to level one, but we also have pre-entry non-accredited accredited provision at the moment. We're actually exploring with a different, uh, a few awarding bodies about making that accredited. Um, so at least, you know, they're getting some qualification with that as well. Um, Many of the learners, as I'm sure you'll know in other um, providers, come in illiterate in their own language, very limited schooling within their own countries, or if they have had schooling, it's often finished at the end of primary or midway through primary. So, as I said earlier, a lot of the um, early time with them is spent de developing their study skills, really, and teaching them the behaviours that's expected within the classroom, but in a very supportive and, and tactful way. We do work related learning with the old, with, well, not with the older ones, with higher level ones. Um, so if they're entry three, they're looking at going on to a vocational course the next year. So in that last term, we look at doing a vocational taster within their, an area of their choice or more than one area if needed. So we do a lot of that and lots of enrichment activities, which um, we talked about. Yeah, I mean, we just have absolutely phenomenal links with our um, social workers, our leave, you know, our leaving care workers, um, the and having that um, mentor within our department, chasing on attendance. Those links have got even stronger as a result of that. So, you know, we're very well supported, and that learner is very well supported in a very holistic way through college, 
through um, their care provider and through their community now because we're making those community links as well. So that learner should feel at the centre of everything. Okay, that's yeah, um, just, no, that's that's nothing different. So, And this was just what we talked about, um, about those messages. You know, this is related to the area, the um, curriculum area where they're in. So again, although we have stuff around the college, there's also focused um, information and, and, and the conduct in different languages and stuff like that. I just can't believe how expensive it is to do those translations. There must be a better way. Um, and again, just some of some of those community engagements that have been covered, but that specifically within ESOL we link with. Um, and I think we've come to the end of our very long presentation. So, thank you, Leila. That was that was great. Um, I do think there was a question that came up, uh, and and someone had asked. I think it was Jonathan from Cambridge. Uh, he asked in the chat. Um, is your student mentor slash pastoral lead an ESOL teacher? Um, they're not an ESOL teacher as such. They deliver the personal development sessions and they also do some of the enrichment. So things like the, um, the bracelet making, the games, they sort of run that. So they are very much a pastoral, not a teacher. But that your personal development sessions that you run, other colleges might call them tutorials and stuff. So there is some type of delivery, yeah, but not the vocational type or the. Actual, I don't deliver. Either. They're not delivering a study program. Great, thanks for sharing that. Does that answer the question? <laughs> I hope maybe Jonathan, if you can let us know if you have any follow on to that. Okay, well, I'm going to now share the lovely video from Leeds City College, which kind of talks about a little bit about one of their after school extracurricular activities, which was um, which really struck us on the assessment team last year when we visited the school. So I'm going to share that video and then we're going to open it up for questions and discussions. And if you're coming in from a college, we'd love to hear about anything that, you know, that you're particularly proud of in the way that you support your students. Um, so bear with me one minute while I um, attempt to find I have about 6,000 screens open, so let me close some of them to get us towards. There we go. You can just affirm for me if you can hear the sound when I play. Can you hear the sound? Yes. Photography Club is a chat based group which means we meet online using Google Chat and it's a space where we can share photos and ideas and take part in weekly challenges and we can also inspire and motivate one another and sometimes we go out on trips where we look at a particular theme, which might be portraits or landscapes. And I think there's something quite special about a group of 
people who have a common interest. And when we're all walking together down a street and we're all stopping every 10 paces because we're wanting to capture that photo, um, it's, it's quite a special moment and we all tend to learn something from each other when we go out. There's a saying, a picture says a thousand words, and for a language student, a camera can be a really powerful tool for them to use to capture emotions and feelings and to share how they see the world. And the ESOL Photography Club has a lot of different cultures who come together and we celebrate and share and we we encourage each other to look at the world in a slightly different way. Hello, my name is Shirin. I came in the UK four years ago. I'm Turkish, but I was born in Bulgaria. I came here because we wanted good education for my daughter and I love rain. I decided to join photography club because I really love to take photos. I thought this club would improve my photography skills. My photography story started with my daughter's born. I like my photography club and its members. My all photography club's friends are good photographer. I like their photos. My goals for the future are first to buy new camera and take more people photos. I want to improve myself more on this point. Thank you. My name is Jidu. I come to the UK in 2020. I come from Sudan. I'm Sudanese. I live in UK because it's a safe place for me. There are many problems in my country. I joined the Isol Photography Club. I joined to learn how to take good photos. I started taking photos when I joined this year. I have enjoyed going on the trip. I want to work on technology photos. In future, I want to be a mechanic. I want to keep taking photos. I came to the UK two years ago as a refugee. I'm from Yemen and I fled my country because my life was in danger. I fled safe in the UK and it was a big change. In my life, for me, my wife and my children are still there in my country and I miss them so much. At the moment, learning English is one of my biggest challenges. I've been cleaning a soul English to speakers of other languages for about a year now. My level is still low. But thanks to Photograph Club, I found a, a way to express to others thanks to pictures. My passion for photography and videography was born around 2011. I have been practicing my hobby in the surroundings where I live. It helped me a little to improve my English all the time. I take pictures with my mobile phone or camera, I can share my passion with other students and my social media accounts. I want to become a professional photographer 
study filmmaking and start on my own uh, business I like to project new things but I need a higher level of English I want to pay ably to show when people are going through and their level through my photo I am sure that they will come My name is Mzada. Uh, in 2011, I came to the UK. My nationality is Kurdish. I'm from North Iraq, Kurdistan. And the reason why I live in the UK is because I want to start a new life. I decided to join the ESOL Photography Club because I want to become an expert in photography and that is my hope. I loved photography as a child, but didn't have time to fulfill that dream. But when I knew that there was a photography club in college, I wanted to participate. I take pictures as a, as a hobby, and I have a little bit of expertise, expertise because I take pictures all time, especially nature. I hope to become a professional photographer in the future. I feel very happy when I take pictures. I look for beautiful things to take pictures. I arrived in the UK as a refugee with my family in December 2018. I am Salvadorian and I was forced to leave my country because my life was in danger. It is very difficult to leave everything behind, your house, your work, your things, your friends and your family. Two of my daughters, my brother and my mother stay in El Salvador. When I came to the UK, I had a lot of anxiety because of the stressful process with the immigration office who treat you like a criminal. Truly, I tell you, only those of us who have had the experience as migrants know how hard it is to go through the asylum process and to be labeled as a refugee because I was not born as a refugee, but sometimes that matters more to some people. It affects you psychologically. I take care of my mental health by uh, taking pictures, documentary stories. The passion for photography and video was born in me in 2006, but being an ISOL student at Lee City College gave me the opportunity to meet teachers like Jenny, who has built brought the ISOL Photographic Club, compassionate relationship with all students in and out the classroom, creating an environment of safety, truth, and respect. This has helped me to improve my English and above all to build a new life with a different perspective. Now I can express myself through my photos and videos and show the vision of how I see the world. In addiction, actually, I am volunteer photographer in the humanitarian organization. And thanks to the ESOL Photographic Club at the Enfield Center, I can share my passion with other students. My wishes for the future are to a student field, become a professional filmmaker and start my own business. I want to be able to tell stories and fill in all my photos. I want my images to say more than a thousand words. I know I can do it. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that video. I thought it was beautiful. Um, and it's just such a powerful example of how finding a shared uh, interest and connection uh, among new learners can really, you know, give them opportunities to express themselves, feel connected, particularly when they're arriving into a new place. Um, I'm just gonna check the chat and see if we have some more questions, but 
now I kind of like to take the next 10, 12 minutes to allow people to ask any questions of our wonderful speakers or share from their own colleges what, you know, some examples of what they're, uh, what they're particularly proud of. Oh, it looks like there's a whole bunch of new messages. So let me scroll down, see what we've got here. Um, uh, look, hi, Laura from Star. Nice to have you here. Um, great. Okay, I don't see any questions, but do feel free to raise your hands now if you want to. I, I would really like to thank Catherine and Rob and Nicola, who I think is somewhere on the line as well from Leeds, um, for 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 sharing so much uh, today generously. And I'd like to thank Leila and Claire um, for, for all the great things that they were able to um, share. Um, so I'd like to open it up now, if anyone would like to have any reflections or just share any thoughts maybe a reaction to that, uh, to the wonderful images we've just seen. Okay. Uh, hi. Yep. Sarah? Yeah, hi. I mean, sorry, I can't remember how to put my hand up. I've, oh, okay. <laughs> I know it's easy, but I, yeah, I'm trying to do other things at once. I just wanted to ask um, if there's anybody on the call able to, um, tell us how um I think it's Jenny isn't it the teacher at Leeds City College oh yeah Jonathan Ingham has come in there as well how do you run the photography club I wanted to ask what has allowed the photography club to get set up and um continue um how is the teacher supported to run that and um what advice do you have for other colleges who want to do something um similar um that obviously has such a great impact on the students involved thank you Oh, hi, hi Hannah. It's Nicole. Hello. How are you? You're right. Yeah, I'm good. I'll, I'll just uh, wave a moment there. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah. So we have got uh, one of our teachers who was in that video. Jenny Cole is incredibly, incredibly creative, um, and so she is a full time teacher with us. But we also do give her some alleviation in terms of teaching hours. And so what she does is uh, every year she kind of looks at the offer that we have in terms of like the activities, social events. Um, she also runs our social media, so our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc. So in the past, she's run like gardening clubs um, so the uh, with the photography club it started off um, with a, a video club and then it's gone into photography and so we um, advertise it like across um, all of our ESOL students and extending out now actually to our adult community students as well across our campuses so this is just for the, our adult students we've got separate um, activities that go on for our teenagers um, and so it's um, how, how she described it's initially run as like ch a chat club uh, as in Google Chat because that's the platform we use with our students uh, for teachers communicating so it's all of that continuation of embedding of digital skills so it's initially chat and that was set up because of our adult students and their personal lives and things that they've got going on work children appointments etc and then what they do is they um, they've also got a web page as well um, and so they decide on different themes um, and then they may go off individually and take pictures of those themes so we saw some examples there like rainbows or clouds or doors or people so they all sort of decide together what they would like the theme would be and then mixed in with that as well we have like uh, sort of like excursions as well so maybe about once a month they'll go all together as a group with Jenny and they'll go to like a specific place and then what's really exciting is that um, we link LinkedIn um, through a uh, community fund and contacts in the college uh, with somebody who is an astrophotographer so taking pictures like of the planets and everything of, of the night sky so he's actually come in and done a workshop with the students on his, all of his amazing photography equipment which is like all the huge huge telescopes um, that are attached to cameras. So he's done a workshop with the students and we're planning um, for the students to go out to photograph the night sky, but it's weather dependent. So the two nights that we'd had planned weren't able to go ahead because not only 
does it need to not rain or have bad weather, but the skies need to be clear. So we're praying for good weather on the 14th of December um, and the students will be going out over near Wakefield where there's like not a lot of traffic or uh, like light from the built up environment. Um, and they'll be going out with the photographer and then one of our teachers to accompany them. So we'll get like a mini bus, provide transport, etc. And then they'll all be able to um, experience uh, taking photos of the night sky and like looking at, you know, the planet and everything so that's really exciting but yeah so that's how we manage it so we've got like alleviation for the teaching in terms of like her job role and then working like I said with the students around like their commitments and so we're like a mixture of online and then in-person activities thanks Nicola that's really good great I hope I hope we can go ahead <laughs> I'm in Yorkshire too and you never know really don't <laughs> although today's weather is lovely it's crisp and bright here today are there anyone other questions uh, for our presenters today or would anyone obviously i'd like to invite anyone to share from 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 their colleges what you may be doing as well to support your students if not i did want to raise an issue that's been raised to us from some of the fe colleges that we work with um because obviously it will no doubt impact students welfare and um well-being issue is is around increasing rates of homelessness among uh, students um, who are have been through the population. And obviously we wanted to kind of reflect and hear from other colleges if you are seeing that uh, amongst your students and how you might be addressing it. And if so, we can share some resources that we've been sharing with colleges to help connect them with their councils on how people are addressing them. It looks like R has raised your hand. So R, would you like to come in and I don't know if you wanted to comment on the homelessness issue or if there's a, another thing that you wanted to share. Hello. Hello. Oh, hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, um, sorry for interrupting you, Sarah. That's okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Sultan. I'm from Cardiff ah. Animal College. Yeah. And hi. I just wanted to also raise this problem about uh, housing crisis. Uh, it's really affecting the well-being of uh, some of our students and uh, I would like uh, some of your uh, advices, ask your advices, maybe you could share ex your experience uh, uh, dealing with such a problem uh, because recently uh, some of our uh, students uh, faced with this problem. Uh, and uh, at the moment in Cardiff, there's a huge uh, housing uh, uh, cri uh, crisis problem, and uh, we uh, approach different organizations uh, such as housing options uh, to find uh, uh, any solution. So uh, it really affects them, and uh, we're trying hard. Uh, so uh, if you have any uh, suggestions, uh, I will be very grateful. To you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Sultan. It's nice, nice to hear your voice again. Um, since we met last spring in Cardiff, yeah, I'm. I, we so I'll share sort of where we are. I, I I wish I had like, you know, here's the fund to go to and here's how to resolve it. I mean, obviously, this is a compounded problem between uh where we have a situation where we have a chronic shortage of housing in the UK, coupled with a home office that is um enacting certain policies right now that are moving people so quickly through the system that there's not able to support and there's not huge additional funding being provided to local councils. So it's compounded by a lot of these factors. Um, so what we have done is our colleague, my colleague who works really closely for the local council network um, has put together a range of resources and examples from different councils about what they've done in terms of forging um, partnerships between local hosting agencies and um, how they're raising the attention to the housing teams at their local councils. So I think maybe what I'll probably do is take um, from her most recent mailing, pull together some of the resources that were outlined in terms of what some other places are doing to address this issue um, and put that into the mailing that will circulate after this. So people can kind of read some of those examples at their le leisure. Uh, I do know, um, I don't know if there's anyone from Sheffield College on the line, but uh, obviously the, t uh, the wonderful folks at Sheffield College got in touch with me about their concerns and I helped link them with their local city of sanctuary group who have been drawing together a uh, and participating in some of the council uh, supported uh, multi-agency forums to kind of discuss this issue and how um, people are addressing it. 
I know at that college they had even, you know, looked at their own budgets and, and put some students up in temporary accommodations and B&B &B and, and hostels to help them kind of uh, on a really short term temporary basis. But, I, you know, can completely recognize that that's uh, a huge yeah. financial ask, which in the current climate can be, you know, not something that many people can talk. Um, so I will put some resources together, but I don't know if any other colleges on the line, you know, are if you want to comment on that or if you're seeing that and maybe what your college is doing to address that i just if there's any thoughts on that i really welcome it hi yeah um, yeah we've seen the same at Leeds city college and this is by no means a solution because um like what we're doing i suppose is just like more about like directing students and trying to support them but obviously we can't provide the, you know, the accommodation, but it's trying to ensure that the students can get support in perhaps like communicating or that they know where to go. Um, so we have like as part of our central support team across the college, um, we have like a number of people who have different roles and one of them like within the welfare team is like we have somebody who can advise on housing. And so they go around our various centres and like, for example, today had a little pop up stall in the canteen. So people are able to like either drop in or also make appointments to see her. Uh, but again, that is referral that referring, you know, to like Leeds City College. but you know for students who are not from the uk and are not aware of like how things work it's just like a supportive process to be able to do that and then also um it also is kind of like along those same themes as well what we have we've, what we've had for the past couple of years so we use google we have google classrooms set up for um every class and we have something called student life google classroom so as part of the induction students are all enrolled onto the google live classroom and then that has like all different topics there as well so say for example it's just about students being able to access that information say if they're like they're not in class or they're not in college or it's it's the weekend or just whatever it may be so we go through the student life classroom so students know where to get information you know from everything to do with like safeguarding housing getting their bus passes applying for childcare, and then kind of like the extracurricular activities as well so it's kind of more of a case of like how we're signposting um then to like various charities as well in the region in the area thanks nicola that's really helpful yeah I mean, I think some of it is about, you know, doing some of that signposting and, and help identify it. I think also it's just useful information also to be connected to the councils. And so councils are aware of some of the impacts of these things and, and who might be needing extra support. Um, I don't know if anyone else wanted to comment on that. Um, I was going to ask, I know we're getting up to, to two o'clock. So if you need to move on and, and go on to your next meetings and things, it's been wonderful to have you here. I'm very grateful. I, I'm going to keep going for a few more minutes and if there's anyone in particular who wants to talk about the process and things please feel free to hang on but I was going to just quickly invite Megan my colleague to mention a little bit too about obviously the Illegal Migration Act and some of the potential implications um, of that act on you know that just to raise awareness of this for all of you on the call while we're together. So. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah absolutely so I've been on a few calls recently where um, people within this space um, and people at the Department for Education are starting to think about what the implications of the Illegal Migration Act are going to be on, um, you know, certainly further education provision, but more importantly, on the experiences of young people seeking safety. Um, for those of you who are not aware, um, essentially what the Ill Illegal Migration um, Act intends to do is that anyone who has arrived in the UK through irregular routes um, since um, March um, will be unable to apply for asylum and seek safety in the UK. Um, what this means is, is that, you know, the aim um, of the current government under that plan is that anyone who is who has arrived post March will be uh, they'll be seeking to deport. They have a duty to remove from the country. Um, in a call I was on recently and um, where there was someone from the Department for Education present, he was very much talking about, you know, I think within the refugee sector, we hope that this will not actually be realistic um, and this won't happen. But the kind of rationale they were having is that they need to work for this, this to actually come about at some point. So thinking about what kind of education provision is suitable for young people if at the age of 18 they will be, be removed. Because just to clarify, you know, young people and children who arrive with their parents will be, um, 
you know, the, the theory is that they will be removed from the country. Young people who arrive unaccompanied will be waiting until they are 18. And then as soon as they turn 18, even before they turn 18, they could be detained um, before being removed um, on their 18th birthday, which is horrific. <laughs> um, but with that in mind, um, you know, they were talking very much about what kind of edu education provision is suitable for these children if um, they, you know, will be leaving as soon as they turn 18, won't be able to access kind of higher education and, and, and the workforce in the UK. Um, I think that that's quite worrying because as far as I'm concerned, all children and all young people should be firstly in schools and then in colleges um, and we shouldn't be looking at alternative types of education. Um, but I just thought it was really important to flag for you all that these kind of conversations are happening. Um, and we've got some information on our website with regards to um, the impact of the Illegal Migration Act that I very much recommend you have a look at so you can start thinking about this because it will probably be affecting some of the young people in your college. Um, so it's really important that you kind of understand um, what they might be experiencing and how you can best um, put some protective barriers and relationships around that. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, we will include that link in the sort of roundup. I don't know if anyone wants to ask any. Hello. Um, hi. hi. No, I'm Rosemary Simpson um, from uh, Craven. Uh, college. I um, just wanted to say hello. That was a lovely uh, warm <laughs> welcome. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, a really big thank you very much for for all your time. Um, it's a very moving and powerful video. Um, and just that, you know, we're really excited, and I think it's an an honour to be part of supporting children um, who have gone through horrendous uh, backgrounds that we probably can't even begin to imagine. Um, you know, to to try and keep them safe and keep them in education. Um, I think kind of just answering or just helping to answer a couple of questions, what we try and do, which was similar to kind of Leeds, is that we have um, our kind of student internet and um, on there we've got a, a collection of, because we cover quite a lot of different councils, we have students from quite a lot of different councils, kind of key areas. Again, it is signposting, uh, but we do have learning mentors that are um, mental health um, trained and also safeguarding trained that can signpost and, and help those students with external support. But we do have a list of services that students um, can access. Um, as well externally so all that information is on our kind of staff internet that includes housing because absolutely housing is is a is a massive issue it includes you know domestic violence cse ce and 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 quite a lot of areas so i think that's where we try and sort of support our student students but i think we've i'm quite conscious we do a counseling service we're very lucky and we've got quite a bit of funding for our own counselling service and an area that I have been speaking to the manager of that service is around is looking at the trauma and the support that we can offer, um, you know, refugee students because it will be unimaginable, um, you know, and just trying to sort of maybe get a designated counsellor, like you said, with, you know, we've got a designated learning mentor and and a student kind of union for that peer on peer support, maybe someone designated like that. Um, but I was really kind of sad to hear as about as that bill being passed then, uh, Megan, about the Illegal Immigration Act. Yes. So it's been passed. Um, it's not kind of started to be put into play as such um, at the moment, but it's very much kind of waiting on that to happen. Um, it is going to be, you know, that we're going to have an, a duty to um, remove people who have arrived at that point. Like that's the whole point of that, that kind of new act. Um, we're not seeing that yet um, happen. I think not least because the kind of infrastructure to manage such a process is not in place. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the calls that I've been on, it has been very much been like, we need to be start preparing for this to be be happening. So that's really, really shocking and scary. I think just to comment on that is so they've put into provision into certain elements of law, they need to create certain, what they call kind of operational policy guidance around those elements, which hasn't been done yet by the current Home Office. Obviously, we all know that there is a general election looming on the horizon, um, which a new government may decide to 
repeal, change that law, put through another act, which takes away the force of the Illegal Migration Act. But again, it's that that's still a long process and it may not be the top of the agenda for the next government in the same way. And since there are duties that have been put in place in that act, it, it, it it's just a very difficult situation because um, there is hope among the refugee sector that we might see changes and modifications to some of those elements, but it's very unclear given the current and, and with our current uh, government, they certainly would not, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, or have not been open to some of the advocacy around some of the issues on these issues uh, on, on on what could happen. So, yeah, it, it it's it's a challenging landscape. Uh, and I think a lot of people are just trying to prepare for, uh, you know, the very worst outcomes and how do we mitigate some of that, but look at maybe ways to modify it if there is a change. Um, so hopefully, yeah, Q-Guns. it's great to have you, Craven. I'm up the road in Ripon, so I'm uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank a lot you. of Yorkshire represented. Um, well, we are over uh, our session, and I think I'll just, unless anyone else has any sort of thoughts or comments, I, I will draw it a little bit to a close. Megan and I will be very happy to hang on the call with anyone who maybe wants to talk about just the process of applying for award, because as I mentioned at the top of our call, we are looking to get confirmation for those of you who might be in, keen to do the process this year. So, um, Otherwise, I will thank you all so much for your time. Huge thank you to the teams at Leeds City College and at Peterborough and Stanford for being here today and all of you for giving up a, a bit of time to learn about these things. I hope it's been useful and enriching and I will send around the recording and a lot of the links and some of the things we talked about today in a follow on mailing shortly. But um, please get in touch if you have any other questions, but thank you for your time and all the great work you're doing at your campuses to support people seeking sanctuary. Have a good afternoon. Bye, Angie. <laughs>